My name is Kutaisha Pasiri. I'm from Zimbabwe. And today I have the honor of introducing to you um, a very interesting, very impressive gentleman, uh, Dr. Kosano Moyo. Um, he's Zimbabwean. <laughs> He was, until August 2011, the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the African Development Bank. Before joining the African Development Bank, Dr. Kosano Moyo worked with Actis Capital LLP as a managing partner for the Africa business. <coughs> he also served on the boards for a number of companies in cement, sugar, finance, tourism, mining, airline, and food sector. He also served as the Minister of Industry and International Trade in Zimbabwe. For three years, Dr. Moyo was the co-chair of the World Economic Forum Africa Regional Agenda Council for the Future of Africa. Uh, he's currently working on the Board of Trustees for the Investment Climate Facility and is on the board of the Africa Leadership Institute. In the tertiary education sector, uh, Dr. Moyo has served as an advisory board member for the London Business School as well as the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Since 1 September 2011, he has been Executive Chairman of the Mandela Institute for Development Studies, MIND. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. Hassan Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I have to say, I, think, I wish I was sitting over there listening as opposed to having to speak because I think you're really privileged to be here from the little bit of, as we talked about this time. Having said that, now I was given a script as uh, people usually do when they invite you to speak, they tell you what they would like you to say, and I'm very bad at it. I never follow instructions. <laughs> I speak on things that mean something to me as opposed to necessarily what means something to others. On this occasion, however, I think there is a bit of an alignment, there is a, a, a happy alignment. So I gather that the core concern for this particular week is poverty. And poverty in Africa, and we have, I think, an interesting conversation about that. But I want to contextualize my perception of poverty and also my perception of what the challenge for you as future leaders global leaders as well as African leaders, my perception of what your challenge is. I see life as being like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. And I think the biggest challenge <coughs> we have in today's complexity is to try to understand which pieces belong to the foundation layer and which pieces are secondary overlays for that foundation layer. As you can imagine, when you go to jigsaw puzzle, if you get two jigsaw puzzles, that's to simplify and mix the pieces. Unless you get those pieces sorted out and separated into the two pictures, you're not going to solve the title. And I think today's challenges about our lives are precisely trying to understand the causal relationships of things and tackling them in the correct sequence in order to deliver solutions. In yesteryears, if I may put it that way, I think life was simple in this way, that the young people sitting in this room would intuitively, subconsciously be learning from the older people that you interact with. Because the older people were meant to have learned through their lives, they were supposed to be knowledgeable and wiser. And therefore, as you observe them, and this was right across the mammal kingdom, if I may put it that way, all animals teach their young this way. You save an apprenticeship over a lifetime. You observe, you absorb, and you get socialized. Now, in today's world, out suggest to you that your elders, the risk you run is that your elders are teaching you all the wrong things. Because they themselves, I don't believe, actually know. 
anymore what the answers are. Therefore, when we go back to this almost like intuitive way of apprenticeship, what does it mean for us as humanity? It means we have to literally reconfigure the way we learn and the way we are socialized. And we'll come back to this when we talk about poverty, because I will mention a few things about poverty. So we've got a crisis of leadership in the sense that the people who are meant to be leading us, actually, the structure of them knowing and being wise from experience, I think is now, in my opinion, to be disputed. Second, so you are going to be tweeting. It creates another leadership problem. Because what happens now, especially in the Western world, I think more so than in our part of the world, is that leaders, instead of being like architects, who can see and envision something in the future that the ordinary person cannot see, and they actually lead us there, what they now do is commission opinion polls and try to understand what the ordinary person thinks at once, and then they try to give it back to you. So where is the envisioning component? Where is the leadership? In other words, a group of people can see the future before them with absolute clarity and like an architect. I think I switched off all my phone, so I'm not quite sure. Like architect, an architect will walk on this piece of land when there, is no, there are no buildings and envision very crisply how the buildings might look like blending into the particular piece of ground. Reduce it to a bit, <coughs> communicate with all of the other parties required to deliver on that development. That's what an architect does. Sees things. Now, I built a house using an architect, and I can tell you, we could see things that I just didn't think were possible. Until it happened, then I said, oh, okay, this is what he was talking about. And I think in my simplest way, I would like to compare leadership, genuine leadership, and that is an analogy. People can envision a future before it's there and communicate very crisply, mobilize support, get buy-in and get it. But now when we follow and go tweets and do opinion polling and, and then just give it back, where is the leadership? So that's the first challenge you have. Where are you going to learn? When you're looking and listening to people like me, should you really be listening to me? Do I know what I'm talking about? Do your teachers know what they're doing in terms of teaching you in the way we've always learned in our community? Not academic. It's about life. How do we learn when, in fact, the leadership are appearing, not to know and go take us from I was also told to share with you a little bit about my own journey. From the comments I've made already, I think you'll guess that I think it's completely irrelevant. <laughs> but there is one component, however, that I would just like to mention. Maybe two components. Firstly, I am born and bred in a rural setting. I used to go to school without shoes on. And when I was being briefed, I was told that one of the your students wrote an essay about this and I was fascinated because the words which were used were almost the same words I used at Harvard 42 weeks ago. So I used to walk to school. I had no shoes. We had no running water. We had no electricity. We had no television. <coughs> but guess what? I never felt poor. Today I still do not believe that my family was poor. I never went hungry, not for one day. And so I struggle often when I hear people describing what they consider to be poverty. Because what is being described as poverty includes a lot of the circumstances in which I grew up. And yet I cannot make the two quite sit together. I don't think I was poor, I don't think I have my family. So what is poverty? Is it material poverty or is it poverty of the mind? Are our interventions, or in fact, our engagement with what we consider to be poverty, in the 
we say we are trying to eliminate, eliminate whatever description you do. In the process, are we sure that's what we do? Or in fact, are we creating what? Covered of the mind. When we tell people they are poor, we make them feel sorry for themselves. We undermine their self-worth, the self-belief, ability to do things for themselves. Are we intervening to eliminate, alleviate poverty, or are we creating <coughs> There is a perception. The people sitting in this audience have come from outside of Africa. They have come, and I am sure, you have come with a precondition and socialization that Africa is a poor country. That's what we've been told. That's what we've seen on television. That's how people raise money. I maintain that Africa is not a poor country. Both, I mean, it is a poor continent in terms of the attitude that we've now been socialized into. Absolutely no question. You know, I go to conferences and I sit and want to literally go under the table when I listen to my leaders from Africa going with begging balls to people saying they want to raise money. And their behavior leaves me in a place where I want to disown them as people who represent me. Because that's not my principle of being led by people who don't believe in themselves. It cannot be. The subtle message is that these are people who feel sorry for themselves, who have no confidence in themselves, they cannot see the richness of our continent in natural resources, in people, in land, in water. They can't see all of this stuff. And they go and they keep asking other people to do things for them. And in that whole process, they undermine <coughs> all of us in terms of our self -being. So, I am ambivalent about this whole poverty issue. I actually am ambivalent about the whole aid issue. Because I think if we as Africans were led properly and started looking at the resources we have, we would have it within ourselves and within our continent and our countries to completely deal with poverty at the levels at which it does exist, because it does exist at some level, but nowhere near to the levels that we've been made or brainwashed to be. No. So that's the first bit about that. First bit about my journey, if you like. The second bit is that I'm always fascinated by young people who write me emails asking me to be a mentor, career guidance, and so on and so on. And I don't know whether I believe in it, because I never applied it in the way I grew up in, where I chose what I chose to do. I followed my heart, literally. First thing. Second thing is, my belief is that a lot of young people focus so much on the future that they lose sight of the present. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? The best recommendation you're ever going to get from anyone is a recommendation about how well you're doing the job you're doing now. Yes, Therefore, instead of worrying about what is the next step? I always say, do what you're doing now and do it to the best of your ability. Don't forget anything else. Because when you deliver on that, the world will, will pay attention. Do the job you're engaged in now and do it incredibly well. And that's all you need. So, from that perspective, I don't believe in expending too much energy on worrying too much about it the future from a career planning perspective, provided you can do what you do now, will absolutely deliver the best opportunity. So, your challenge, let's go back to the jigsaw puzzle. And let's go back to poverty. If you were in a war zone, and you're in charge of running hospitals, and you had the means and the authority to intervene at different levels. So there's a war going on. Casualties keep coming. And you are competing for resources from the nation. Let's call it, let's just confine it to a country. 
would you put a lot of money in all of the money you had in creating more beds for people who are coming in or would you invest in trying to eliminate the cost of the world? Which would be the best way to do <coughs> It is my view that in our endeavors we find it easier and sexier to intervene at increasing the beds in the hospital and not addressing the cause of the war and therefore eliminating, if I may call it, the supply of the patients in the hospital. But logically, you will understand, you don't need rocket science to understand this. For as long as the war continues, you will never solve the problem. So as we worry about poverty, again, I'm not going to give you solutions because I don't have any. But I can give you, if I were to go back again to my career and say, what is the best thing that I ever learned? It's much more a systems approach to try to solve problems. The problems change all the time. So there is a methodology which I think is much more important by the specific, than any specific answer because the problem, the challenge is change. So I think as you tackle your challenges as you exercise your leadership roles. There is a system way, system way of thinking which says, understand the structure of the problem and make sure that in your mind you clear about the causal relationships and then tackle the problem at the truth, at the root of the problem, not the symptoms. Because the symptoms don't give a solution. At best, they give you temporary <coughs> relief as opposed to a solution. <coughs> So again, I've given you this hospital, field hospital, go back and address why there is a war in the first place. Am I saying you should not treat the patients? Not at all. It will be inhuman. <coughs> but what I'm trying to argue is in the allocation of resources, we often put all of the resources or a disordinate proportion of the resources into the wrong places. Once we are addressing the hospital's issue, Let's try and divert enough resources to solving the problem generally. The root cause. Poverty is the same. As you go back to your communities, as you go back to your country, when people talk about poverty, try and be more challenging. The UN, you know, I, I'm going to get unpopular about this. If you look at World Bank, if you look at the UN, if you go into countries where these, these organizations actually operate and look at the lifestyles they lead, even at salary level, something as simple as the salaries they pay their own people, they are completely inconsistent with what they need to do. So be a bit more challenging in terms of what we say and what we do. The levels that we do, we intervene and what is <coughs> As opposed to whether I can tell you how to go solve poverty, I'm sorry I'm not capable of doing that. But hopefully, I've set you off on a path to try to analyze the issues in a more systematic way. Let's tackle the socialization issue as well, as well as addressing materially the issues that lie behind poverty. But a lot of it is to do with socializing people, not to believe in themselves. We should try to address that. Thank you very much.